Okay, welcome back to the podcast. This is episode number 182 with my guest, Margaret OG. Uh, Margaret, this is her second time on the podcast. She's a good family friend of, of, of myself and my wife, Stephanie. She was a congregant of Stephanie's church in Scarsdale, Grace Lutheran, and she now lives in Berkeley, California. Um, big fan of Margaret. Margaret, she and I have had amazing conversations over the course of our relationship, and this one is no exception. Um, I hope you enjoy it. Margaret and I tr- trust each other, so the conversation we have is intense, but it's also amongst friends, so I hope you take it in that context. I uh, hope you're all doing well, staying safe, staying healthy, and I hope you enjoy this conversation. Without further ado, Margaret OG. Take care. Bye. Well, Margaret, are you ready to gavel this to order? Yes. One more time from the top with a little more feeling. Yes. Okay, great. Well, Margaret OG, let's. Uh, this is your second time on the illustrious podcast, and um, we. Um, I honestly don't remember what we talked about because it was like three years ago, maybe two mm-hmm. years ago. Yeah, me it was, either. It was in a hotel room. So let's assume. Let's just pretend we've never met. Let's start there. Um, okay. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, but we. We both, I think we were texting before this, and I think we wanted to sort of focus today's conversation, given all the chaos in society and tangential rabbit holes we could go down. Yeah. Um, I think we we do share a common sort of life overlap, the Venn diagram of life overlapping, and it's the church. Um, the church. You are heavily involved in the church, and I'm tangentially heavily involved in the church because of my wife. And um, yeah. there's a lot of stuff going on um, around COVID. And so I'm kind of curious, maybe, um, can you just talk a yeah. little bit ab- about what you do in the church, what your involvement is in the church, and then mm-hmm. um, we'll get into sort of the issues around COVID and whether or not churches should open up. That's sort of the, yeah. the, the prompt for today. For sure. So I have a few um, levels in- of involvement right now. I'm currently on my internship also called a vicarage depending on where you are Mm -hmm. um which church you're at and it's um my last requirement of seminary um how many years is the program that you're going through four so this is my fourth year so it's similar to what steph steph had to do yeah and what you're you're lutheran correct what'd you say you're lutheran correct yes lutheran um and so <clears throat> it's three years of academic work and then one year inside of a church working with a congregation. And so I started um, beginning of September and um, inside in this congregation, I'm at St. Paul Lutheran Church in Oakland, California. And I live just outside of Berkeley in Richmond, California. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, in when, if we weren't in a pandemic, I'd be in the office every day Um learning the different things that are going on in the church in in that particular church um working with the staff getting to know the different ministries that they're doing um at saint paul we call them task forces Mm. um so there's the black lives matter task force there's the outreach task force there's hunger there's there's a lot of different do some churches call that like ministries of the church is that another ministries of of the church yeah yeah so um yeah, so I'd be getting to know everybody there. I'd be participating in staff meetings, in council meetings, um, all in person. Mm-hmm. What so? What's different? And then part, and then be being involved in Sunday worship and children's time and Sunday school and all mm-hmm. that. So I'd get to learn everything. I'm still doing all of that virtually. Mm-hmm. Um, I go into the church when I preach. Um, I preached one sermon pre-recorded from home and it wasn't, um, it just like didn't feel right. And so I'm going Mm -hmm. into the church, um, once every time I preach and then, um, otherwise every meeting is virtual or over the telephone, depending on what Mm -hmm. the, like our staff meetings are on the phone. Um, Mm -hmm. I have supervision on the phone with the pastor that I work with. Um, on Zoom or yeah. over the phone, or literally over the phone? Over the phone. Hmm, that's interesting. Yeah, our staff meetings and our one-on-one supervision is always over the phone. Is there a reason um, and why, I, why and not visual? Yeah, Zoom fatigue. You don't get ear. You don't get phone fatigue though. No, because I'm actually never. I'm not on the phone as that much. Mm. Like. I, I, I'm part of the phone tree, so I call 
parishioners, members of the congregation, mm-hmm. talk to them, check in and see how they're doing. Um, because in the non-pandemic world for people that are homebound, you'd make house calls if that's what they're comfortable, if they're comfortable with that. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but because that's not possible right now, we are, it's all on the phone and some people prefer the phone to zoom. Um, some people get weird if you're on zoom, but your camera's off. Yeah. Um, that's, that's for me has yeah. been the hardest thing with teaching is I've had to be really aggressive with students and say like, like we had a guest last night at NYU for the steel band. And he's from Trinidad. And I was like, your screens are on. And they were just like, well, but my back, I was like, I don't care. I don't care if your mom's doing laundry in the background. Like you have no problem being in a room with me and me seeing everything you do for three hours face to face. Like, I know it's weird to have your mom walk by with the laundry, but I don't care. And it's important to the guest. There's a presence. There's a level of commitment that is shown when you unmute your screen and it's hard. But like when they all did it, oh my God, it was light, night and day, like totally different vibe, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but you, and you so have there's to like, almost demand it, you know. Yeah, if that's if that's, and for what you do though, that's different. If that's different than like I think being in, for like what I do, if I were in a, if I'm in a council meeting and I and I turn off my video, they don't need me. They need me listening. They need my participation. But if there is a guest speaker. Right. Or if I'm trying to learn something from mm. someone, I'm like, I'm in a, for example, I can turn my screen off in a council meeting. One, I'm not, I'm, I'm there to learn. I'm there to listen. I'm there to offer feedback if, if need be. Right. Like. We should do the see? whole podcast like this, Margaret. <laughs> yeah, that'd be fun. That'd no, be fun. it wouldn't it'd be awful. Except <laughs> that'd be terrible. I'd be like, I'd rather just call you on the phone then. Cause this is weird. Um, but the, there's a level of engagement that is not required of me, but when, um, but then I'm in a Monday night group, it's a 12 week group that is going through a, um, a going through, I'm just pulling up this book that's going through an anti-racism training. So we're reading, I'm still here, Black Dignity, uh, Black Dignity, Dignity, Austin Channing Brown, and then mm-hmm. <clears throat> uh, White Fragility, and then we're also, uh, it's accompanied with this, 40 Days of Prayer. Mm. So this is a group that meets every Monday night for 12 weeks for an hour and a half. If my video is off, unless I'm like, hey, my, I'm going to turn my video real, off real quick while I go grab my dinner from the kitchen, which is only like 25 feet away, then um, you know, but if it's off the whole meeting, like I'm muted the whole time unless yeah. I'm talking, mm-hmm. but that just feels like zoom etiquette, but I'm not going to have my video off when we're talking about, um, racism. There's a, yeah, there's I, a level of like commitment you need to display. Like, sorry, you're right. not allowed to solve racism unless you can show me your video screen. Like, that's a like we gotta have some filter here of who gets yeah. to solve racism. Yeah, if you can't because I your also want to see, I also want to see people's it could, because it, there's so much that's lost on Zoom, right? Mm-hmm. And so like I want to see your reaction. I want to see your reaction when Betty is like, I don't want to give up any of my rights right i want to see betty's a 35 year old white lady mm-hmm. named betty just go mm-hmm. with it um and she, i want to see people's reactions mm-hmm. when she says that because that's real that's that's i hear that working in church i hear that so much i don't when when talking about racism and stuff so like I want to see everyone else's reaction and I want everyone to see my reaction, which is this. Mm. I think it's a package. I think it's fine. Okay. You can get it if you need to. I can edit it out. All right. Hold on. I'm going to mute myself and turn off my video.
All right, I'm back. Okay. Want to know what was so important? Sure. Well, I'll show you. It was the AirPods. Uh oh. Yeah, mistletoe. Do you know the? Do you know the? Uh... Birds bees. Have you asked? Have, have do you know the gender of the baby? No. Are you waiting for a surprise? Yeah, wow, that's I want, good. That's like um, one of life's last surprises. Is like, what is going to come out of there? <laughs> yeah, and it'll be like one of the last. Hopefully, it's the last surprise at all of 2020, and it'll <laughs> end with a good surprise. Do you have oh, a? God. What's your ego telling you that you want? Want versus a boy? Yeah. Why is that? A boy. Um. Just because boys are better, or is it? Or is there more reasons than that? Or did you just think the male species is <laughs> better? No. Um, better I suited for long didn't... jumping and mammoth killing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Hunting and everything. No. You know what it is? I didn't know this like about myself until until we, started, we were like, oh, my God, we're having a baby. Um, I don't know what it is. Something inside me just like really wants... Oh boy, I think I want the, like, I'm excited. I want to raise just like a strong um, sensitive, gentle man. Make him play steel drums. He'll be, he'll put him in a steel band and most of your work will be done for you. Perfect. So Perfect. that's my advice. I want, I want, if it's a boy, I just like want the opportunity to raise like, such a gentle gentleman um and i'm putting a lot of you're putting a lot of faith you're putting a lot of faith in your ability over what genetics will give you and i i have this there's like karma may just send you like a young republican man who wears like a blue suit like alex p keaton sort of family ties sort of oh my god i'm so i'm i'm like you know what a boy or girl i'm not really worried about that what am i gonna do with a straight child (laughs) well maybe that you know they'll they'll sort of be like let me show you, Mom. This is how we do it. Right, You'll like, be fine. You'll be. Great. I'm like, am I? What do I do with? I like, I'll take a boy or girl. I don't care, you know. Like, but a straight, like a straight child. I'm like, I'll figure it out. But I'm like, yeah, yeah but it's don't know what don't know what to do with one of those. Yeah, but you know what the parts are for. I mean, sure. you know what goes where, and like those are questions that you don't need to be straight to know. <laughs> You know, and I think you also know what it's like to be loved and not loved or desired or not desired or me, you know, have emotions crushed or be broken up with. And those are all the same, whether you're straight or gay. So I think. Yeah. But they'll be in a queer, they'll be in a queer family. So that'll be, there will be something to that. They'll like by, right, by proxy, they'll just like, there will be a queerness to their identity. But they also, they are, they also will be in a queer family, but they don't know they don't have the they don't have the sort of historical or personal baggage around what that means to you they're just growing up in a house so like if yeah. you tell them that everything around them is a specific thing they'll start to think it's weird but if it's just a yeah. house with two parents who go to work and love each other and are making yeah. dinner and sometimes fight and scream and sometimes help you with your homework and sometimes don't know the answer to your biology questions you know like yeah you know it's just a household you know at that point and i think i'm so glad you could explain that to me (laughs) margaret i quit i just love messing with you i'm straight splaining to you i'm straight mansplaining to you (laughs) straight mansplaining it's the best all right well let's get back on track here we can, I can yes. tell you what to do with your life later. Um, let's get back on track. Here. Great. Margaret, I'm just trying to tell you you're going to be a great mom. That's all I'm trying to tell you. Don't Thank worry. You. I'm excited about it. Thank you. Straights are easy. Um, you're going to be great. All right. So we're I... back, back on the church thing. We were talking about Zoom etiquette and... Um... Yeah. So then there's this whole... So then there's this whole question around opening back up. Mm-hmm. 
right? Do you open back up? What does the city say about opening back up? We have an epidemiologist on our reopening task force. Mm. And she's been really helpful in navigating kind of like, yeah, don't do that. Or mm. yeah, that's fine. You can do mm. that. Um, and then there's the pastor's role who the pastor is getting. And I think you, you have probably seen this with Stephanie. The pastor is getting like, my soul needs to gather in person. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of like, everybody's all of a sudden Catholic guilt. Like everybody knows how to exact the like, mm-hmm. you don't know what this is doing to me sort of thing. And it's like, yeah. while at the same time, the answer back is always like internally, no kidding. <laughs> like, right. you don't think we're, I know that? Like, And we're in a, like, and we're in, we're, and we're in this pandemic and we're all experiencing it in many similar ways, but all very differently. Mm-hmm. Like I couldn't imagine being in a pandemic and living by myself. Why? I Like. Just the solitude you mean? I think after a while, I think I'd enjoy it for a while. And mm-hmm. then come June, I would have, that would have been difficult. And I would have found an alternative. Also, if I lived alone and I saw the pandemic happening and coming, I would have, I think I would have found someone else to like bunk up with. Yeah, my brother lives alone. Uh, Well, actually not anymore. He moved to Athens, but he was living in, um, uh, uh, sorry, Charleston, South Carolina, and was living by himself when the pandemic started. And I think now having roommates, it's like, yeah, it's a total... I, I, for me, the, the thing that just feels is frustrating. I know when Stephanie gets emails from parishioners, um, I mean, I get it less from my students because it's just a different thing. Church and oh. school are two different vibes right now, but like, yeah, it's been frustrating for me to, to go online and have to deal with the fact that like, I, you know, the other night I was, I was on Facebook doom scrolling and out of my like 10 friends who teach at various universities doing steel bands, like nine of them were performing together, you know, out, like their kids are able to all wear masks. Their schools are social distancing and doing things. You know, they're in areas where there haven't been spikes or whatever in New York city. Like the, the kids, if they get sick, they have to quarantine. They don't have access to instruments. Like it's all these mm-hmm. crazy things. And so they're like singing their steel drum parts into their phones and emailing it to me. And I'm piecing that together. So we're doing like steel drums as a choir piece because they don't, while my other friends are doing basically back to normal with masks on, you know. And so when, if I'm experiencing that level of frustration, there are, there's Catholic churches in Manchester that are fully open. And so where, two blocks where away. You live. Yeah. yeah. And two blocks away, Stephanie's church is closed. And so she's getting the questions of like, well, a Catholic church is open. Why can't we open? Which then puts her in a position to be like, yeah, it's just really tricky. I mean, it's. Because it's, yeah, I mean, how do, how, do, how do you answer? What what are the sort of answers you're having for people? Because this is theological, which is something that, I mean, just to call balls and strikes, theology is not rooted in fact. It's rooted in a communal sense of an obligation to your surroundings, to your people, and to an obligation to something that you can't quite put your finger on what he, she, they, it might be, as in God. Mm-hmm. Then it's... And the- and the theology is like okay so what do you believe about right right? theology is like what you believe about god so like who and what do you believe god to be do you believe god to be this like omnipotent like non not present far away in eternal rest like eternal kingdom right or do you believe god to be relational and active and 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 reactive in the world Mm -hmm. And how do we, and so like when you have, it's no mystery to me why people have no problem going into a restaurant, sitting down, you know, being masked or like all of those things going to the grocery store, like everybody's following the aisles, right? right? Because you're not required to believe, you're not, you are not asked to put your own emotions into the grocery store. It's like, well, just get in your cattle car line and pull your cereal, yeah. do your thing. Church, you have the freedom to think to look at the Bible and decide that Leviticus means gays are bad, you know, and that mm-hmm. fits within the theological bubble for a lot of the people in this country. You can look, mm-hmm. you can find one blip about abortion and be like, yep, abortion. It, or you can look at it and see it completely differently. And so like somehow, the, it, but the church is a business. 
It's a building. It's a physical place, just like finish line or foot locker is, you know, like you yeah. go there to get something and that's not a belief system. That is a real factual moment where human beings, fleshy bags of bone and blood are bumping up against each other. Mm-hmm. That's not a belief system. And so these two things are bumping into each other in a way that is causing a lot of cognitive dissonance for people. And it's, it's fascinating to talk to people that because in one breath they can be like, yeah, you got to be socially distanced. And I totally understand why school, I'm not I'm keeping my kid home from school, but why can't I come to church? It's like, because this building operates the same way the school does, <laughs> like air moves through it. Like, you know, um, right. You know, so how do you, how do I talk to people about this? I say, Because you have to learn. I mean, this is something you're having, you know, you, you mentioned up front, you're in your studies, which when you're studying, part of your vicarage right, is so I'm to, in this, to learn I'm how in this to do learning, this thing. Yeah. So I'm in this learning process. And the question I always ask is, what is the faithful thing to do? It might not be the popular thing to do. It might not be the um, thing that seems most pleasing to God, whatever that means and whatever that may be. What do you mean by um, most, what's most, the most faithful thing to do? What does that mean to you? Like the word faithful, why, why that faithful. word? Mm-hmm. Um, the thing that will, that offers the most um, care to the people of God. Got it. Okay. That to me, that Which, means that it's like when somebody says like, be more musical. I'm just like, no, I don't even know what that means. Be more musical. Like, like if I, musical, if, yeah. if you told a person to be more faithful, like that, that doesn't mean anything to me. But what you just said is actually like, oh, yeah. that's actionable and intelligence I, would, I can do. And I would never tell someone to be more faithful. I would say I would frame it as how do we faithfully live together? How do we faithfully care for one another? Mm-hmm. How do we, how do we be church in the world not just in the building but be the church in the world faithfully and that's by caring for one another and Mm -hmm. to me dismantling systems of oppression and injustice and all of the things that jesus would want us to do so when i think that when i think about going back in person and i think about you know, I think I, I look at where I live, right, which mm-hmm. is the state of California. And our governor has been pretty conservative um, in and pretty... Is it Newsom? Yeah, Newsom. We went into shelter in place, Berkeley did at least, um, March 16th. Mm-hmm. So, and then masks were ordered, ordered on in April. So... Um, April or May. Excuse me. So when talking about regathering, right? So then you have to like look at the numbers and look at the coloring and all of that. And it's like, okay, Alameda County, where my church is, we are, you know, the numbers have gone down. You can now, you can now gather 25 in person Mm -hmm. masks, social distanced. Yeah. Okay. We are still closed. Mm. We're not even thinking of reopening because we're still in this. It's still, um, we're seeing, we're seeing now all across the country, all of these like spikes in numbers. There are people that are saying that we're not even, people are like, oh, this is the third wave. We haven't even gotten the numbers low enough to be considered to be out of the first wave. It's been wild to watch. I mean, I know California, like Seattle, you know, sorry, Seattle, Washington, um, uh, Washington State, Oregon, like the West Coast was sort of, and then New York, because some of this virus came from Europe too, not just um, China. Uh, there are two different right. strains. The one in, on the West Coast, has they've, they've determined has come from Europe. And the one that you all have, I'm sure it's different now, but that strain came from Wuhan. And so like to see you all, you all got it early. But to see in the New York Times the wave of red sort of work its way across the country in real time has yeah. been crazy. And it's just like, this is proof of science. I mean, if you if you are, you can just be like, yep, watch this for the next two months. 
and predictably mm-hmm. it just marched its way across and as it as a state turned red it went back to yellow and calm down. And it's just like, I can, we're going to see that happen four or five times over the next year, you know, before we lose half a million people. But it's like the idea that this isn't happening j- just because your particular numbers have gone down yeah. and it gives you this sense of like, everything's cool. It's, it's, it's a, it, it's just a, th- it's a thing I think that's hard for humans to grasp. You will, we tend, we love to tend the garden we touch um, when it makes us feel good. But like, as soon as our garden's just like, I don't know, you got to stay home. You're like, no, I don't want to do that anymore. And it's like, wait a minute, yeah. but you know, uh, so, but like, it's, how are how did you all make that decision? So the, so we, the reopening task force has come up with this. Um, the first they were taking their direction from like the city guidelines. And then our pastor reaches out to other pastors across the country. Mm-hmm. And it's like, what are yeah. you doing? Stephanie's doing that a lot um, as well. Yeah. Like, what are you, what are you all doing? And a lot of people are like, okay, we're doing in-person gatherings outside. Um, You have to sign up 12 people max. That's what Steph's doing. Um, You have to sign up. You have to, we haven't even done it yet. We're still planning our first one. Mm -hmm. Um, We also, with the physical space of the church does not have outdoor space. Oh, It's in a city on the corner of a a residential block. Mm. That's it. So we don't have this. We don't have the physical space and the circulation within the building is really poor. And the congregation is, there are a lot of people old that are older. So that has kind of led a lot of the thinking. We also have a very cautious staff. Mm -hmm. Um, And the council is taking its direction from this task force. So this reopening task force has like five or six people on it. One's a lawyer, one's an epidemiologist. Um, and then the pastor and maybe one or two other people. And so when you're drafting guidelines, you know, we're going to have a form that says it's a wellness, basically a wellness check form, mm-hmm. you know, and you have to fill it out before you come. Um, are you having symptoms? Have you come into contact with anybody that has had symptoms? Yada, yada. So there's that. Um, but we're not even considering going back inside because Alameda County just passed this like 25 person in ga- in person gathering. Um, but there's a real, there's a real concern at the same time for people's spiritual health. And so that's something I've watched our, I've watched our pastor struggle with is like she's like how do I you know people need spiritual care and so we've also um you know you hear from the different groups in the church right like the choir is just when can we gather in person again singing on zoom is not the same um and then you have the people we've also been doing communion mm-hmm. so people have been doing virtual communion um so there's there's that aspect to it too mm. is that you know from the beginning it's like okay we're n- we're not together but we're together and we're doing we're taking part in the sacrament i'm um, blessing the elements virtually um grab your juice grab your bread grab you know and let's do this thing together even though we're still we we're separate but together mm. and then like what is that even what is separate but together mean right so like there's all of these of those pieces, we are going to do in a couple of weeks a, um, so with the, so under the auspice of people, mind you, people are already gathering, right? Members of the church, they're friends. They've been friends for 10, 15, 20, mm-hmm. 30, 40 years. They're seeing each other. Right. But the ask of the congregation is when can we gather back in person, but more so when can we gather under the auspice of the church? When is the church going to say, this is a thing being done by this church? 12, so we're doing that. 12 people can sign up. We're going to put it out. And then the other thing that we're going to do is uh, drive up communion. Mm-hmm. So yeah, you drive I mean- up on the street. Everything is prepackaged. You take it. You get the elements get blessed next family 
you drive up prepackaged, you know, all COVID yeah. safe elements are blessed next to family. I love that they're called elements, by the way. It's like the, the, like the most sanitized, like clerical word you can use for like the, the body and blood of Jesus Christ himself elements. Mm-hmm. You know, it's amazing. Um, I learned about Stephanie started calling them elements when they had the, like, I think you said the, it's like a little plastic thing of wine with a foil thing and then the, a little wafer and then another cap. So it's like all sealed within. So no matter who touches it, you're not touching the actual elements. Um, I'm what, how, I mean, one of the scenes, I don't know how much personal responsibility you felt given where you are in the sort of pecking order at the church of like you're a vicar. So like, it's not the, the buck doesn't stop with you if you make a decision yeah. necessarily. But with Stephanie, I know she's had a lot of like her anxiety comes from the same questions. When can we get back in the church? When can we sing together again? Um, she cannot shake the feeling of responsibility that would come if someone got sick and died or someone got sick and was in the hospital and racked up $300,000 of medical bills because they decided to come to church. <clears throat> now there's that level of yeah. responsibility she feels of just having made the decision to open the church. And what is that? Yeah. What is she then ethically liable for having said, let's do it. Then there's the, like, if you find out that the person who got COVID got it from you during communion like, like if some people know exactly how they got it, or if somebody, you know, this is, yeah. then, then, you know, you've killed somebody inadvertently and that no matter how many pieces of paper, someone signs saying, this is my choice. It's still a member of your congregation that you are tasked to care for. And your decision preempted and led to their eventual death. If you're just calling balls and strikes, like objectively a one or a zero, what happened here? Did the person die? Yep. How did they die? They came to church. They got COVID who decided the church could be open. The pastor. Those are three facts that you can't now now, with Stephanie's decision-making process. And I'm sure it's similar with yours. The pastor doesn't have unilateral say there's a council. There's deliberative bodies within the church that, like you said, you have a task force. So the, the responsibility is shared, but at the end of the day, like on the banner outside of your church, it doesn't say task force run by. It says this past, this is the pastor of this church. You know, right. he, she, or they are responsible for every bag of bones and blood that comes in and out of here. Yeah. And, and that is just, that's a ball or a strike. I think that Stephanie is not willing to swing at right now because no. she just doesn't want she doesn't want to have to bury somebody right now, especially right now and during 2020 when if somebody got buried, you, they could, all of their relatives couldn't even come to the grave. You can't site. even have like a proper funeral that like right. somebody would want. No, and you can't put that you can't put that on a pastor. Like right, right. Stephanie doesn't make the final decision. Like the the council votes, right? Those are like council voting things that come up. So. But right, how do you then care for the spiritual needs of the people that you're caring for when we're hearing left and right, like people, people are isolated, like in the midst of an election, in the midst of civil unrest, like, and, and, and a global pandemic. So then how do you care for people? Like, and my, I mean, I've heard my sister has a friend who committed suicide during the pandemic like the shit is real like it's real and so how do you care for the, the those people that are isolated that are considering suicide well i i think even and can't gather right but i i would say that one of the responsibilities of a pastor or anybody in the leadership position is also not to give the perception that things are fine you know like like for me it's taken a second but you know uh, our good friends Kim and Tara lost their son Tobias or sorry Malcolm um, not because of COVID but because of something else and Mm -hmm. just the circumstances around the lockdown the quarantine like we did a drive-by like wake I drove by and they were sitting in their yard wailing yeah on a blanket it was the most traumatizing thing I think I uh, Honest to God, seeing my dad die was easier than this. 
like yeah. this was a scenario it was like the black mirror and I'm still processing it and it really and then the thing and just permission to speak freely here but like the chaos around everything and the way humans were dealing with like being locked inside um protesting the lockdowns was horrifying and you were a right-wing nut job but then when George Floyd was murdered the streets filled with people and medical professionals were out there saying that that racism is a public pandemic that we need to protest but we can't open the church because 25 like you'll have to pardon me for being confused you'll have to pardon me for like of course George Floyd of course are you kidding me like of course but my friends Kim and Tara were sitting in, I couldn't hug them because medical professionals told me that th- it would kill them. Mm-hmm. All of a sudden, there's this this thing that happens with George Floyd. Now all of that doesn't matter. And I will say, like, despite my my anger, like, it really made me see things irrationally for a while. Like, really unable to, like, I was just mad, pissed off. Like, I didn't care because of the thing I had to do for Kim and Tara. Like... And so yeah. when this is coupled with, again, I just like the disclaimer is like, of course, George Floyd, of course, of course, like that just sickens me. Like anybody who would think that that wasn't a cause for outrage is insane. But when you put everything else that has been going on, we're all locked inside. Like, I think we all have to be really careful about like Stephanie also needs to be honest. You need to be honest with your parishioners and say like, I'm swimming here. <laughs> like, I well, don't know what I'm doing and I'm making this up and I'm traumatized by things that I never thought I'd even have to process. Like, yeah, you know, and well, I, and it's complicated grief too. everything you right. just said. There's an aspect of grief. There's an a, there's there's a loss. There's right. And then there's the aftermath of that. And there's like, I mean, we are eight, nine whatever many months into this mm-hmm. yeah, eight, like, eight months i think i figured P- out the other day ptsd like that's a year years this is like decades right? like, long sometimes for some people yeah like you had you experience ptsd from 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 like from any kind of traumatic event and so then when you stack everything on top of each other it is complicated i will say that taking to the streets because of murder that is right that it that 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 amplifies systemic racism i and everything else that is wrong with this this country like i think that um we can't that's a tricky space to then compare to, well, why can't I gather in church? Well, only in the sense that like, right. I, I'm, and it, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm devil's advocate here. I'm just telling you the questions I've had, the frustrations I've had with these. Yeah. And to me, it is tied because the reason why Stephanie is not opening the church is because of medical professionals saying what they should or should not do. This is, yeah. and, and around the protests, like I remember very clearly watching reports of like those people protesting in Michigan outside the courthouse, like there's yeah. 12 guys with long guns, you know, and everybody's like, look at these guys, how they don't care. They were all masked. They all had bandanas over their faces and medical professionals were horrified. And those same medical professionals were then saying, well, racism is a public pandemic, so this is okay. And I do think it is important also in chaos to be very clear with where science doesn't care whether or not you're black or white, whether or not you're protesting for a good cause or a cause that you feel is anti-American, you know, this is, that is true. That is a strike. That's a one or a zero. The pandemic, if you gather in large crowds and scream at the top of your lungs, that's how it's passed. And like that to me, when I'm now having to look with Stephanie, looking at medical professionals, as irrational as it sounds, it's like, I don't know who to trust, you know? And so I have to, I have to aggregate the best I can with all of the data I have, but you know, with all of that data, I've decided to teach remotely the entire year. 
because yeah. I don't know who to trust. I don't, I don't, I mean, I trust medical professionals more than I trust Alex Jones, but like, you know, I, I, right. I still am like, what is going to be the thing that happens where they say, oh, well, this is okay to do now, but this isn't. It's like, well, either yeah. you're either, you either care, it's either true or it's not. It's either the virus will kill you if you gather in large crowds or it won't. And to me, this is the confusion. I think a lot of people are coming to church and saying, you know, I can go to a restaurant. I can go do this. I can go do that. Why can't I come to a church? And, you know, I don't, again, I'm saying like, I want to keep churches closed for the year, like all the way through May. Like, I don't think any church should open up until we know that we have a vaccine and we have therapeutics and treatment that really work that take the mm-hmm. death rate below take it more in the realm of the flu you know in terms of what it does actually yeah. like i'm not going to lose my mind about like you can op- the church has been opened with the common flu for decades like and that's always yeah. a risk people can die of the cold when they come to church yeah. but right now there's another member there's another person in that church who is named covid and wants to kill people there. And I just, I, I really am, am coming down on the side of, of, it feels weird to say conservative, but like small C conservative, like, mm-mm, that's too scary for me. I'm not willing to be brave yeah. right now. Yeah. And I don't, I think keeping church closed has like challenged us to come up with different ways to care for people and get creative about how mm-hmm. we care for people. Mm-hmm. Um, and even me, I'm trying to learn how, how do I get to, how do we get to know strangers? And how are like, well, As how in, are you solving that problem? How, what are some ways where you felt like, Oh wow, that actually worked. And I can't believe it worked. Well, I mean, not a lot, actually. I'm having a hard time feeling because we're not in person. We're not going into the church. Like we're not going, we're not even going into work yeah. in the church. Like, um, but I have another job where I, I work part-time, um, like where I am a dispatcher for a uh, plant-based meal delivery company. And mm-hmm. so I dispatch 50 plus drivers twice a week to deliver meals in the Bay area. Um, and so I'm coming in physical contact mm-hmm. with, a lot of people and a lot of different people all of the time. Um, and we are masked and we are, we're outside but the entire time, mm-hmm. but we're masked and we stay six feet apart. Um, and there is also this, just trying to get to know people has been difficult. So I've been kind of just in cold, cold calling people and emailing them. Mm-hmm. Um, I hold a sermon reflection on Monday mornings. I'm going to mm. start doing office hours. Um, people get to know me from preaching, like the, my, from what I'm preaching about, what I'm talking about. Um, I post videos on the Facebook page. Um, so there's different ways, but it's still, I'm still, you know, I said to my supervisor this week, I was like, I feel like I'm not. I don't know anyone. I know a couple of people. I know a handful of people, the same people, but like becoming a new pastor in a congregation in a pandemic. Like, I don't remember when did Stephanie start here in August? Uh, she started in October. So my supervisor started in October too. Mm. So you've been pastoring a congregation, a new congregation yeah, for a couple months pan- and then yeah, for a couple months in person. And then all of a sudden you've been pastoring a congregation virtually longer than you have in person in the midst of a pan, a global pandemic. And how do you get to know people? And they tell you when you join a congregation, when you become a new pastor at a congregation, don't mess with anything for the first year. Mm -hmm. Right. Like don't mess with the liturgy. Don't, you know, get to know the people, gain their trust, like let them trust you, let you trust them, build relationships with people. And then, I'd be like, then get under the let's hood. Let's try it, and, right? And then get under the hood and be like, I want to try this. I've watched how this works. I don't know. I think we could do this better. I think we could do this differently. I think, you know, I think what you really want as a council is this, mm-hmm. 
and I, I have an idea to make that work right so like um and framing it in a way that's like I want to empower you this is something that you seem really passionate about yeah um and so there's that and it's like how the hell do you get to know people how, how often and, are you doing uh, you said the most of your like your meetings are on the phone or your you know interactions with parishioners are on the phone. How often are you doing one on one Zoom stuff with anyone? One on one, not that much. Because I would say not for a- me, I I had a similar. I still have it because um, I have to do Zoom teaching with you know twenty kids on a screen. I have so meetings um, mm-hmm. that are five or six people, and it's more just nuts and bolts stuff. I've, we also have meetings where you have to be creative and we're trying to co-write music together or rehearse something, you know? Um, but then I do a lot of these, which are just one-on-one, you know, either podcasts or just meetings with a student about something. And I got to say, I feel like total dog shit after teaching large groups of people. Mm-hmm. I feel like total dog shit after every so meeting, it doesn't matter whether it was a good or a bad one because there's mm-hmm. fifth, you know, five or six people on a screen that you got to manage. I feel invigorated after every one-on-one and I don't know why I can't figure out what I'm like. It makes me think about like, I don't know, like if there's, um, if you have some appliance in your house that just does one thing really well. And every time you try to ask it to do the other three settings, it doesn't quite do it as well. Like it's just Mm -hmm. super good for one thing. And I feel like zoom allows you to have 700 people on a screen and it feels like I've got a community, but it exponentially makes it more harder more harder it, it, it makes it exponentially harder to genuinely communicate yeah. and i can read your facial expressions here i can tell i knew the minute i said the thing about george floyd i could see you look away and i and i was like oh yeah, yeah. cool like i know what that is like and even though i knew that you were having a reaction i could also sense that you weren't having a violent reaction you knew that this was a friend talking like you can digest all those things in real time and we right. can keep having a genuine conversation after which I feel invigorated speaking for myself. I don't know about you, but, um, so, no, so I, w- I would recommend, this conversation. I would recommend that like, I've been really trying to avoid, like if a student has questions, I'm just like, see me offline. Let's do a one-on-one because we can share screens. If a, if a parishioner, for example, is like, I don't know how to work YouTube. You can walk them through how to share their screen. You can ask for remote control of their computer and click things for them. Like it's a tool that you can use, but yeah. it works really well one-on-one. And I bet you could develop, you could find some inroads and in, in, for some, for some people, technology and zoom is just like, it shuts them down and they just stare at the screen and don't participate. But for others who are yearning for it, you may for find other people. For people in the congregation, some of them are like, I am by seven o'clock on a Thursday night. They're like, I am here for, I am here, but I am not here. Mm -hmm. While there are other people who are like, this pandemic is the best thing that ever happened to me. Yes, sometimes I'm lonely, but now I can participate in things at church that I was Mm -hmm. never able to participate in before because I couldn't drive, because I couldn't leave my house mm. for a seven o'clock meeting i've always wanted to be on council i couldn't be on council because a b and c so this is this pandemic some people are thriving in it well and when i mean listen you're you're you're, you're advising so on some stuff about about accessibility and inclusivity it's like oddly for some people this is the most accessibility and inclusivity they've had in any organization they've ever been a part of Ever. which is important and awesome. And we have to figure out a way how to scoop those people up too and give them the faithfulness and, and the care that they need because they clearly, they're jonesed. And so if, if I just get inside my own, there's some students too, if I get inside my own head and I'm just like, oh, I got to figure out how to do this the way I want it, I'm going to lose a few of those kids who are actually really thriving right now. And, yep. you know, it's hard. It's so hard. Cause Losing I feel- the, because you want to be there for the, all of them, right? Like you want to be there. And how do you do that? How do you care for, and it's the same thing in, I think in pastoral care. And I'm sure like Stephanie is running into it. I'm sure she has people in her congregation that are like, pastor, I don't ever want to go back to church. This is great. Or they're not saying it, but they're like, it's implied. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then there are the people that are like, and here's, here's to answer your question about why can we gather in the streets and protest George Floyd and we can't gather. We can't, 
and we can't gather in church, right? Mm -hmm. Because in church, there is something about it. I have people saying to me, I don't want to gather until we can touch each other. I don't want to gather until mm -hmm. we can hug. People, for some reason, and this this brings up a whole bunch of issues of how the church was functioning pre-COVID. Mm -hmm. Passing of the peace, I go to the bathroom every time I have to pass the peace. I dip out. Why? Because I don't want middle-aged white women coming in and wrapping their arms around my waist, telling me that they're a hugger mm. and not asking my permission. So why are we not gathering in person? Because people, at least, at least for me, people want to gather in person. And they're like, some of them are like, I don't want to gather unless we can hug. I don't want to gather unless I can embrace this person. And of course, of course, right? Because people have died and they haven't been able to bury their family members. People mm -hmm. haven't seen anyone in nine months except for the grocery store clerk and their mailman, postal worker. They People are, are and, and we are human beings. We cannot survive without mm -hmm. this, yeah. right? And pastors know the minute that their that their flock are gathered together, they're going to be bad. Oh yeah, they're going to right. And so it's we like still don't just know. Like, I'm home, and like they take their shoes off. You're like, hey, 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 right. hey, <laughs> right, right, right. Like, oh, we don't we don't wear shoes. We don't we don't wear shoes in the house anymore, right? Like we don't wear shoes in the house anymore. And people are like, but well, I'm home. Right. Like, I'm not don't tell me your new rules. I'm home. Well, and for a lot of these, I'm home for some of these people for older in the defense of folks in the church who might be older. Some of those people may have like in the case of Grace, Grace in um, Scarsdale may have literally helped build that church. Yes. And so you are not going to tell any 90 year old person where to sit. Like, sorry, yeah. this pew's closed. They're going to look at you and be like. I paid Your for that Your job's about pew. to be closed. Yeah, I paid for that pew. I put the bolts right. in the ground and I can close you down, buddy. Like, yeah. <laughs> you know, and it's like, yeah. what are you going to do? Yeah. Like, you're right. You built this building. Right. Like, who, like, who am I? You're like, I was baptized in this church. You can't right. tell me. I right? buried my like... husband here. Like, I did all of those things. You know, like, it's a very personal. Mm -hmm. This is why This is why I said the thing up front about the belief and how personal, like, church means something. What, that's why I asked you about what faithful means and when, you know, mm -hmm. it means something different to everybody. And everybody. And my understanding of my role, my pastoral role, is how can I care for everyone collectively while still tending to the individual needs of people? And so I think that by having a hybrid, by being creative, mm -hmm. by being like, okay, we're not about to go into the same kind of, you have it's fucking snow on your ground. It's fucking 75 degrees here and I'm sweating and it's like almost one in the afternoon and I have to like go change my shirt because I get like all if my window's not open, right? It gets too warm in here. Like I it we have the luxury, right? Of like, okay, so we're starting, we're gonna start even now in November doing small outdoor gatherings mm -hmm. under again the auspice of the church. Yeah. Mind you, there are people that have, it's, it's, we, when we gather, if we gather with a friend or if like my sister, she comes up to visit, has come up to visit once in October and once in September for a week, you have to assess your own risk. What are mm -hmm. you willing to risk? Mm -hmm. And that's the thing, like individually, I'm willing to take a COVID test. I'm safe. The every, my mask is on whenever I leave the house, Right. My sister wants to come visit for a week and not wear a mask. We all get COVID tested before she before she comes. And we live in a county that is doing free COVID testing. You mm -hmm. don't have to have symptoms. How long you does it get take tested? for the results? Four days. Okay. That's great. So you want to get tested? You go to the library. Mm -hmm. And you, you awesome. go online. You pick a time. You go to the library. You wait three minutes and you're the next in line. This is one of the... So, Sorry, go ahead. No, so like everybody is a, is 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 assessing what they're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. When you care for an entire body of people, it's just it's 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 different. Taking to the streets, that's individual risk assessment. Mm -hmm. 
you are you are you are saying i am comfortable putting my body in close proximity no one's forcing to another you to body. go out and do it and like it's not a, right you are doing it right you've agreed to if that you have social a social contract if you have a if you have a compromised immune system right and you can't take to the streets and you're you have you you have the um advantage of working from home so you are not you have the financial means you're online you're online like minnesota freedom fund you get a hundred dollars right like food bank down the street from me you get a hundred whatever it is i can't take to the streets i'm gonna take my money and put it to those places Mm -hmm. that are gonna get the people in the streets out of jail Mm -hmm. with the church I have to think about like I if I'm I'm I will not again Stephanie's concern. I will not be I will not put myself in a position where I could have prevented someone from getting sick or worse mm-hmm. someone from dying on my watch. Right. Yeah. Not going to do it. Not going to do it until there is science and there is collective science that says this is how you can do it safely. One of the things that's been the biggest, I mean, I, I understand, I mean, I'm, I'm not a sort of burn it all down person when it comes to complaints about the way our systems work. Um, mm-hmm. But I understand the, when people say like the system failed us, I, I could, I totally can empathize in many ways in versions of the system failing. I think in terms of COVID, the thing that has disappointed me the most aside from the lying about facts and all, all of that stuff, there's a whole lot of things, host of things that have disappointed me. But the I, like this country, in terms of calling balls and strikes, contains 330 million people, of which there are some of the world's smartest medical professionals, engineers, mm-hmm. uh, tech people. The Why we didn't... I mean, forget, say what you want about Elon Musk, right? Whatever. But why we didn't passed the Defense Authorization Act or whatever it is that said, okay, Elon, you know, we understand that you like making cars, but what we need right now is a piece of cloth that when you put it over your mouth and breathe, it turns one color or the other to tell you whether or not you've got COVID. That's what we need, bro. Like, we don't need a battery right now. We need a simple tissue that you can just pull out of a box, wait 13 seconds and be like, and then you can come in. Like, why... Yeah, that's going to cost a billion dollars, but to have, but can you imagine our economy if if the only thing you needed was a like to breathe into a cloth? Every restaurant, every church, every baseball game, every movie theater, you know exactly then if anyone in there is sick. Are you telling me that's impossible? We put people on a moon with like 82 megabytes of, of, of technology that's less powerful than the the first iPhone. Are you telling me we can't come up with a cloth that turns a color whenever you breathe into it? Well, that's sure insane to me. Right. But I'm sure somebody already has, but, but I think that, I don't know. I'm about to fall down like a government conspiracy rabbit hole. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe let's, let's, let's avoid that because, but I understand that like I do, I do agree there. There are many, there's lobbyists at play. There's a million business interests at play as to why that maybe doesn't happen, but nobody even tried. Nobody even like if the president had come yeah. and said, come out, I mean, in world war two, we turned every car factory into a, like a bomb and tank missile factory. Like, yeah. Do I want them making bombs and missiles? No. But no, but do you want them? Do you want them making like, yeah. Like effective COVID tests. Yes. And, and, and PPE. Yes. Jesus. Yeah. I mean, sorry for my language, but mm. I think this is like Jesus H. Jesus Christ, Christ. Are you kidding me? Yeah. Jesus what's, the Christ, H, yeah. what's the H stand for? Is it like, I don't know where that came from. Anyway, it just, that's what bothers me to no end about yeah. this. All of this is like, yes, Stephanie needs to make decisions about the church. But if there was a tool that just made everybody in that church feel 100% safe. Like, I just, I refuse to accept that that's hard. I refuse to accept in a country where we can put a rover on Mars that lands upside down and then can land, and then we can, we can, we can make it land on a platform in the ocean within a half an inch of where we think it's going to, we can do that, but we can't get a freaking Kleenex that turns orange. Yeah. Uh, 
I mean, sorry, this is the stuff when I smoke weed and I'm staring at the stars at night. Like, this, this is the stuff that makes me so upset. Is like, yes, there's real problems in the world. The George Floyd murder and how we as a society deal with that is crucial to our survival as a species that needs to interact with each other of different colors and different shapes and sizes and all of those things. This is easy. The racism yeah. thing is hard. This is easy. But we somehow have made it as complicated as everything else in our life. And I just don't mm -hmm. see how we're going to get out of it until, like, uh, do you, it's let me easy. ask you this. Do you think, when do you think this fear will subside to the point where you can open up again? Personally, when do you personally think you'll feel like, if you had to put money down right now? Mm-hmm. What would be your drop dead date in terms of where you feel like, yeah, okay, by then I'm, I think we can do it. Next January, 2022. I, it pains me to say it, but I think with the data I have now, if things just progressed, I would say we're not reaching herd immunity. I, I would say anytime. ask me, I would say ask me again in a year. Yeah, well, no, that's, this is, I mean, I, I like to sort of make yeah. predictions and be, and just see how far off I was. And I think that I'm, I'm in agreement. And I think most health professionals and most people who are realistic about this, if you ask anybody in the NBA to, to the people with billions of dollars to figure this stuff out, yep. like the NFL is having problems with this and they are a billion dollar organization. So I can imagine a manual Lutheran church in Manchester, Connecticut is going to, you know, <laughs> have a little well, bit of a tough time. Yeah, and what was it on SNL though that the Michael Che on Weekend Update it was like, how is it that the commissioner of the NBA has fucking figured out COVID, and the United States government cannot figure out how to keep people safe, or like can't come up with something, but yet the commissioner of the NBA has somehow created a bubble, like an NBA bubble. Yep, testing because like, they're they're all living at Disney in Florida, you know, like. Or Are wherever they? they were. Yeah, I think they, they walled off part of Disney World or whatever, and that's where all the players stayed and practiced and all that stuff because they it was the NBA bubble. Like, they literally quarantined the entire NBA in Disney. I think it's Disney. I mean, you have to, I'll have to double-check my work on that. But, yeah, but this is the thing. Like, when you talk to epidemiologists or you talk to people who have studied pandemics or epidemics in the past, yeah. there's one surefire way to burn out a virus, and that's quarantining. I'm sorry. There's no other way. If you got Ebola, the only way to stop it is to put everybody in a house who has Ebola and let them melt down. That's the only way. And that's the way it's been for thousands of years. And right now it's like, yeah, there's no, it's no wonder why the NBA is doing it because they yep. locked everybody in a house. And if you got sick, you got kicked out of the house, <laughs> you know? Yep. And that's why LeBron James now has his third title or whatever. And yeah. we just now have to figure out, and, they figured out how to function. The NBA was still a basketball game. The players are still doing what they're doing. So we ha restaurants have to figure that out. So do churches. So do but the problem is, is there's no money. There's no funding. You know, restaurants and churches are scrambling for any funds they can right now. And so, yeah. so your predictions about a year from now. Um, what do you? I don't know how to figure out how to ask the question. What is your do you feel like the church is going to come out of this better or is it going to come out of this limping or is it going to come out of this um, a better version of itself? My hope is that we'll both. I think, I think two things. I think that because this pandemic has also lifted up the under like the underbelly of our nation and mm -hmm. shown like you said right there's two pandemics happening mm -hmm. the pandemic the, the forever long pandemic of systemic racism and you know like this awakening to like the system isn't broken the system was fucking built this way so it can't be broken it was built to function like this where um where brown black indigenous person bodies of color are systemically at a lesser advantage mm -hmm. um, uh, across all lines. Um, you know, people are like, no, it's, it's a broken system. No, it was 
built this way and meant to function this way. There's nothing broken about it. We need to break it and rebuild it. Um, I think the church is being confronted with that and going to my hope and prayer is that the church will get better at, at addressing that Mm. um, and dismantling um, systems of power that keep marginalized people marginalized. Um, I think that the pandemic will cause certain physical churches to close. Mm. And I think that churches and councils and need to be very strategic about where that money then goes. Mm -hmm. And I, my hope would be that that money would go to their communities. I would hope that if a church has to shut down, that they would not be sending the money of, from that sale directly back into the synod, directly back into churchwide, which is like mm-hmm. Chicago, right? The larger church body, yeah. like our national, our national people. I would hope and pray that congregations would make the decision to put the money back into the communities around them, specifically into organizations and people that are living in the margins and organizations that are working to help people who are um, victims of this racist country that we live in. That One of the things hope. that's been, um, I mean, what little I know about the Bible and, and just listening to Stephanie preach, it's like Jesus was dealing with sickness and epidemics and mm-hmm. floods and national tragedies and all of these things it, yeah. it's happened. This isn't new. Um, but I think one of the things that's, that Stephanie has mentioned that I've been shocked by is the, that people, people, when, when you say the word church, the first, if you ask somebody else, tell me the first thing you think of, the first word out of most people's mouths is building. And so because it's turned into a fucking country club, not a way of being fam church together. Right. It, it's, right. But it's, it, yeah, but we've all contributed to it. I mean, the, you know, Stephanie, yeah. in defense of those people who like, there's a reason, you know, all of the pyramids are changed different colors. It's like you make the church look a different way for different seasons and all of these things. It's like, there's an appearance that, and I think it's important, but I do think that after this, I think what this is doing is that we may lose a few people, but I think yes. for the folks who remain, for whom the church has, yes, been a part of the building, of course, but mm-hmm. for whom the church is people, I think those people will come out stronger, yes. a little beat up, but I think their appreciation of the building will mean much more to them once we can get back to it. Um, and. But I'll be I'll be I'll be curious to see how this evolves. The church is a very unique body, and the way people operate within that ecosystem is almost totally cleaved off from the way people operate in real life, um, mm-hmm. in many respects. And I don't know. I'm curious to see how it plays out. And churches are family systems, mm-hmm. right? So if you think of it from a family systems perspective, and the pastor is the parent, like you get the pastor, you get, you, you get that, you get the projection of all of people's like parental issues Mm -hmm. projected onto the pastor, but like, but larger, it's a family system and how, yeah. How are we going to be church together and be family together again once we can return in person and, and there is meaning and there's tradition and there's, you know, there's ritual, within the space, I think a lot of, um, and, and ritual is healing and it, mm-hmm. and it creates resilience, right? It is so for me. I mean, people ritual's who relied, huge for, ritual's huge for me. I mean, that's, that's one of the reasons I go to church for me is it's one of the reasons I play minimalist music. It's like playing, doing the same thing over and over again and getting it mm-hmm. like, that's a ritual thing, you know, and for me, and it can I be get a, healing. Like, yeah, totally. And, and I think that that's what people, um, people miss that will you make me a grilled cheese too <laughs> um covid right like yeah. working from home that's right um yeah but the churches that don't survive my hope is that they will do the just do some do the just thing with their 
money. Yeah. Well, Margaret, I don't know that we've solved anything today, um, but I think we both are in agreement that churches should be closed until January of 2022. 2022? <laughs> so. Um, will you bring Stephanie in here so we can talk about should people be doing virtual communion until then? No, I'm not getting in between the two of you on that. I do not have any dog in that fight. Um, and do- I'm. <laughs> I'm fine with the elements out of out of a prepackaged thing from Cisco. I'm also fine with somebody pulling out a piece of white bread from their fridge. I don't care, but I'm a drummer. What do you think's going to happen on Tuesday? What do I think's going to happen? I think. Well, I have lots of anxiety about the trauma from 2016 in terms of the polls. I understand yeah. why people are skeptical and think it's going to be close. Yeah. I think it's going to be a Biden landslide. I was right about Trump in 2016, um, and everybody in my friend circle thought I was batshit crazy and made fun of me, yeah. um, but I was right. And with this one, I think there's enough people. I think Trump's going to get a lot of votes. I think people are going to be mm-hmm. shocked at how many votes he gets, but I think there is enough people for whom politics being in your life every waking minute of every day because the Trump because of Trump tweeting or whatever... Mm-hmm. I think that's exhausting. And I think, um, I think Trump's time is up. I think people gave him a shot. I think a lot of people love him. I think that those people are, that's who you see at his rallies, but I cannot shake the feeling of Joe Biden is going to, I think it's going to be an electoral landslide in a way that Trump's team and the Republicans had zero idea was coming, but I've been wrong before. So (laughs) we'll find out in a couple days. What do you yep. think? I'm so, again, the trauma of 2016. I woke up in the middle of the night, the night of the election into mm-hmm. the next morning. I woke up in the middle of the night and I saw the saw the ticker on my phone and I was getting married four days later. Mm-hmm. And I saw it in the middle of the night and I didn't wake Abby up. And I was just like, nope, I'm just going to fall back asleep because this has to be a fucking nightmare. And then I woke up to a text from your wife that was like, kill me now. Kill me now. Are How are you doing? She married right? you and I was too, just right? Like, like, so she was probably. She did our, yeah, she did our blessing, our marriage blessing. We got married in San Diego, but then we came back okay, the, right, what, okay. what we did in New York. Stephanie yeah. officiated that. Yeah. yeah. And, but yeah, fucking crazy. Well, I will, you know, the, the, the I'm hopeful. What, for, I'm hopeful for Biden. I will say that I am. I want to be hopeful. Mm-hmm. I think he will win. And I feel like also saying that out loud jinxes me. Yeah. But I, I, I don't agree with Biden on everything, uh, but I do no. think that I like, I respect the shit out of him that he chose the one person for his VP candidate who almost single-handedly sunk him mm-hmm. by calling him out. And I, that says a lot to me about him. And I, you know, I'm mm-hmm. not even necessarily all aligned with Kamala Harris either, but to yeah. me, it says something about a president. Their first decision as president is who their vice president. That's like, that's a bellwether for how they're going to make decisions. And Trump chose Mike Pence. Someone who would never yep. challenge him on everything. And so why do we expect you know, him to be any different? And I feel like Joe Biden is going to try to overcorrect, overcorrect and bring in... Like, he's going to try to bring in Republicans. He's already talking about like hiring John Kasich to be on his cabinet. And there's a part of me that's just like, bro, this is our turn now. But the American in me that wants to see us come to a more complicated, nuanced version of ourselves says, yeah... yeah. Okay. Kasich's yeah. not a maniac. I don't agree with him, but he's not a maniac and he's not a bad person. And yeah. so maybe that's we'll it's see. like taking my vitamins, you know, like I don't like taking them, but it's better for me. And I think, you know, I've heard John Casey talk enough. He's from Ohio. Like he's destroyed teachers unions. He's done a lot of shitty stuff, but I've also heard him speak respectfully and intelligently he doesn't talk shit about people he doesn't mock mm-hmm. black people or gays or like he just sort of is like conservative and i can i can at least find common ground there with him yeah but i don't know we'll find out in a couple of days well in the meantime margaret 
please give my love to Abby. I love you dearly. I'm so grateful for you taking this time. Yeah. And um, anybody it's on this happen. podcast who gets anybody who listens to this and gets upset about the thing I said about George Floyd needs to just back off because you and I are friends and we can have these discussions. Yeah. And you know, this is how difficult conversations. And if you can't have these difficult conversations, then like, don't talk to people. No. Yeah. (laughs) You know, or get better at talking to people. Right. Here I am. Don't talk (laughs) to anyone. I can't run. I can't run down the block without getting out of breath, Margaret, but that doesn't mean I should never run. That means I should probably go for a walk once or twice a week. Go for a walk. Yeah. (laughs) Oh, speaking of which, you're in California, so you don't get, like, I don't get to do this out here in Connecticut. You should start a walking ministry where you just get a few people from your congregation. Just go for a nice walk. Talk to them. Preach to them. Deliver your, do a practice sermon. Like, hey, I want to get in a bat at this before I get in front of a camera. Like, go for a walk. You can do that in California. I can't now in Connecticut because it's snowing. So I'm going to lay a little Catholic guilt on you before we sign off. Right. I'm like, ooh, okay. <laughs> good. good. All right. Sounds good. Okay. All right. Sounds good. All right. Lo- love you, Margaret. Thanks, Take Josh. it easy. Tell Abby love you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Okay, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. This podcast is brought to you by Liquid Drum, liquiddrum.com down in Waco, Texas. Uh, my good friend Todd Meehan runs an amazing percussion company down there. Great merch, great content. Check him out, liquiddrum.com. Also, Kyle Dunleavy, dunleavypans.com, D-U-N-L-E-A-V-Y pans.com. Kyle Dunleavy makes and builds all the steel drums that I perform and teach on, uh, and so percussion, as well as at NYU and Princeton. Uh, he's an amazing, amazing tuner builder. Um, just a really nice guy. Very dependable. Check him out. If you are interested at all in steel pan advocacy, uh, want to learn more about the goings on uh, in pan in Brooklyn, check out paninmotion.com. My good friend Kendall Williams, uh, Jerry Guy, Trisha Guy, and uh, Arisha John run an amazing organization called paninmotion.com. Check him out. And finally, Aliandre Mirage runs an amazing uh, clothing apparel company in Brooklyn that is steel pan centric. You can check him out at mango chow, C H O W, clothing.com. I own a bunch of his shirts. They're amazing, very stylish, uh, beautiful, beautifully made. Check them out. Mango chow, clothing.com. Okay, hope you're well. Talk to you soon. Bye.